out there, how we fix them, and then talk a little bit about our fisheries today. Some things we're seeing that are really positive on the fisheries side. That's good. Awesome. Well, we've we've had uh, um, uh, Carlitos. Uh, what is it? The um, captains for uh, water, clear water. Yeah, captains for clean water. Yeah, uh, uh, Benny Blanco, I think his name is, and we've had uh, uh, Bull Sugar present. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Water keepers. Too. Water keepers. Any water yeah, keepers? Biscayne water yeah. keepers. Yeah. yeah. And we actually, it. we actually, I participate in the Biscayne Bay. Uh, was it Water Watch or whatever it was? The UF uh, extensions. Yeah. Um, hey, wait a minute. So did I. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, uh, so I, I took samples once a month for what about three or four years. Great. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the Lake Watch. Was that it? The Lake Watch? The UF Lake Watch? Is that what you're talking about? Biscayne Bay uh, Water Watch, I think it was. Water Watch. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So Sounds we did really dissolved good. oxygen and uh, uh, pH and salinity and temperature and all kinds of stuff. It was fun. That's awesome. Okay. Very good. Most of the cool. people that are, that are retired here are professionals. Some that aren't nice. retired are also professionals. And scientists. So we have uh, physicians and, and PhDs and, and uh, uh, lawyers yeah. and uh, all kinds of professional people and uh, people that and have folks, life folks experience too. too. <laughs> cool. Well, that sounds good. I, I, I put some slides together so you have some photos okay. and pictures to look at. All right. But then yeah. we can keep it informal. So just feel free to. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I'll turn it over to you, and I'm going to – you're a Tim Rowland uh, a blog cast uh, the other day. I watched that. that. That was pretty good, too. So Which one was that? The, uh... Tim Rowland? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the About the jacks? That yeah. Was a, that was a nice, long presentation on the jack for the jacks, yeah. Cool. Let me see how do I get this um, – share the okay. slides with uh... – yeah, so we, we went – we were on the – on the show talking about Jacks, Jack Carval. Yeah. That was really fun. Yeah, you had the, the student. Uh... Oh, I lost the sound. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Well, I'm gonna share screens. I think I, I can do it now. Perfect. Apologies for that. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So sorry, okay, thanks for your patience. I don't know, it just completely died. Like I was like, wow, I don't even know if it's gonna come back, but it looks like it's working now. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Everglades, what's wrong with the Everglades today. And I'll make this a little bigger. Uh, and then some of fixes that are needed and then what's going on with our fisheries and the Everglades. Um, a little bit about us first, I'm gonna go to the next slide. We are a uh, fish studying fish for about 15 years. And uh, we've been studying snook for the longest and bass. Uh, we study a lot of their food. And then here's some of the other species we study, which is jack creval, juvenile tarpon, spotted sea trout, and bonefish. We're hoping to start a study on permit um, coming up soon. So we study all these different fisheries. A lot of what we do is trying to figure out how, you know, flows and hydrology, what happens with the water affects fish. That's kind of our task. Um, here's a little bit about how we study fish. We do, we do, we do a lot of angler knowledge. So we end up, um, we use from guides and anglers. So I have it in there. I, mean, I, bought, I bought it. Karma, mute everybody else. Okay, okay, sounds good. I heard some sounds. Yeah, so we end up using for our studies, a lot of times we use expert opinion and we don't have a lot of data on our fisheries and how they're doing, so we rely on angler knowledge, on expert opinion from users, from the fishing guides, and from you guys, anglers like you guys. We interview you, we do qualitative stuff where we interview guides and anglers. We do quantitative stuff, meaning we try to turn your perspectives about what's going on with the fishery into, um, into numbers that managers can use, into things, something that can tell us about like how is the the quality of bone fishing. So here's Jennifer. As, as an aside, yeah, Bill Groot Curtis was a member of our club. Oh my God! Really? Okay, we yes. interviewed him. Yes. Oh my God, that's amazing. I didn't know uh, that. Yes. Oh, cool. Okay, so we interviewed him about bonefish decline in 2016, um, maybe a year before he passed away, which was really neat. You know, I mean, he's so much knowledge there. So yes, that's the kind of thing we do. We try to when we don't know about fisheries, we go to the guides and we talk to anglers. 
Um, we've been working with a group of bass anglers that's been fishing the Shark River in the park since 1968. <laughs> wow. You know all about their, and we check in, they kept track of their fishing records, how many bass they caught every year for the past 20 years. So we analyzed those data and presented that to the park and see, see this is what happens with bass fishing. So that's the kind of thing we try to do, try to take, you know, perspectives. Here's an, a figure, and I don't know if can you see my pointer. Yes, yes. Yeah, here's a figure of people interviewing folks about shots of bone fishing and then tracking that over 40 years through interviews and tracking the decline in Biscayne Bay versus Florida Bay versus the Keys. Um, so we talked a lot to the guides and we try to make the knowledge. And this figure on top shows you, this is a study in the Pacific Northwest, but it shows how one line is the angler knowledge, the perspective from anglers and resource <laughs> And the other line that you see superimposed is um, surveys, quantitative surveys that were done by scientists. And all you need to know is that those match up, right? If you look at the two lines, they match up. What the anglers are saying about, as you know, about what's going on with the fishery matches what um, they're being, but it's being conducted with, with gear that's measuring and catching the number of fish. So that's one way we study fish. Uh, another way we study fish is we use a lot of uh, catch records. So we go, to, for instance, a Flamingo and an Everglades National Park since 1980. Jason, shown here, has been interviewing anglers and catch, asking them what they catch. And so we take those data and we, and we analyze them and figure out what's the pattern in the fishery over time. And I'll show you a little bit about that, what we learned about fisheries from that. Um, another way that we study fish is that we tag them. We take these little double A battery size um, tags. We put them in the bellies of snook, uh, tarpon, bonefish, uh, sea trout, jacks. And then we have these little hydrophones. You can see here, they're like little microphones under the ocean. And we put them everywhere. They're really expensive. So we try to put as many as we can out in the world. And then we, they hear the tag and each fish has a unique identification. So the fish go about their lives, the tags last between four to seven years, and they give us data where the fish are, right? We have to have a hydrophone to know where they are. But here, for instance, here's the Shark River. It, we, we've been studying snook movements there since 2012. And every little dot is a, is a hydrophone. It's a, basically an underwater microphone. And it's here for the snook moving up and down the river. So whenever we have more or less water, it dries, it gets really wet like it is now, we can tell people that manage water what the snook are doing. So that's kind of a cool way of doing, uh, of tagging, um, of getting data. So here is one of, uh, it's Natasha putting a tag on a snook belly up. Here's the, the tag goes in. It lasts seven years, it's the size of a double A battery. And here's a receiver out in the, in the bottom of the Shark River, listening for the snook and here's the snook being released. So this is a really cool way of uh, finding out what our fisheries are doing. And we have receivers, there's people in Biscayne Bay that have receivers that track sharks and all the, the tags are compatible. So when, when our snook moves into somebody else's uh, set of receivers, they can get picked up. Wow. Yeah. So, for instance, for Jack. Hey, quick question. If I can yeah. ask you a question, do you do you have any of those in redfish in Biscayne Bay and any uh, receivers? We have receivers in Biscayne Bay. UM has some, but mostly it's all sharks. No, no redfish. Uh, it'd be you. really neat. We haven't done a lot of fishery stuff in Biscayne Bay. We love to do that, and now with all the fish scales and stuff that's going on in the bay, I think there's going to be more funding. Um, but a, folks, a group of folks at UM have um, tiger sharks, hammerheads, bonnets, and nurse sharks. Wow. And they track their movements. And it's kind of neat because it's like an urban shark study where they're trying to figure out like, you know, the, the, these sharks that we, we used to think they're like hammerheads that are, you know, they're kind of like out in the wild. Apparently they really like certain lights and they go in the very, you know, like down Miami, Miami River, like in the mouth of the Miami River, there's, you know, hammerheads. <laughs> um, they're attracted by lights and they're tracking the tarpon, but um, it's very, it's a cool study. Yeah, so we're hoping to do more of this stuff in this game bay. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So we do a lot of that. And here's an example of what we learned. I'm gonna go to the next slide. 
So here's the Shark River. I don't know if you, know, you guys know what that is. It's on the western side of the Everglades. Kind yes, of like, we do. Yeah, OK, cool. So with it, this is OK, of course. Here's Tarpon Bay. Here's Ponceleon Bay. So we have receivers all up and down. And we track snook, but our collaborators put the same tags on bull sharks and alligators. And we have them also on bass for the up, up headwaters. Um, so here's a snook that is and this is a little older, but we have lots of data from this. This is a snook that was, we tagged, we took a photo of it, we put it in the belly, we released it. And here's distance from the coast. So this snook is up in the headwaters up in here. And then it goes down to spawn in November, or excuse me, October, goes to spawn, comes back, goes back to the headwaters. There's a lot of food up in the headwaters in the dry season, goes back to spawn in May the next year. And then it stays around the coast. So he's staying mainly in the brackish and the freshwater? Yeah, they're staying out. It only goes down to the salt to, to spawn. Yeah, yeah. super wow. cool. Yeah, yeah, and they they're up here because in the dry season, all, the marshes around it dry, and all the little sunfish that are in there, they have nowhere to go but to go up here in the rookery. Cool. So it gets packed with prey, and the snook move up, the bull sharks move up, tarpon come in through migration, and they go up and feed, uh, and it's a feast up there for about. Maybe, you know, depending when it dries, sometime between March and April, and they eat like crazy and then they go spawn. That's where the cane patch is, right? Yeah, yeah. So we when we sample, we camp at cane patch. Cane patch is right here. Yeah. So we're oh, going God. next week, not this weekend, but in next the week after that, we're going to cane patch. We'll camp here and then we're we have an electrofisher boat that puts electricity in the water. Uh-huh. And can catch the, the snook that way. And then we'll That's a sure way to catch. Yeah, <laughs> we'll tag a bunch of fish uh, and have a ball camping uh, with this weather. It's amazing. So we'll do that. And then, so we've been doing this for since 2012. So we, we know a lot. And now we know when they go spawn, what triggers are spawning, when they're up here, and it's very predictable. So if you want to go fishing here, you can, you can ask us about <laughs> when they're there, because we'll know when they're there. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so this is another way we study fish. So this is just a little bit about us. So I want to just talk a little bit about what's wrong with the Everglades, how we fix it, and then how it affects our fisheries. So the Everglades we have today are, as you know, are 50% of the size. They're fragmented with all the canals and levees. They're drier, they're fertilized, they have a lot of nutrients, and they're saltier, right? Uh, and you may have seen this depiction of the Everglades that um, was done sort of like a depiction of what the Everglades would have looked like back in the 1900s and it's so much broader. You can see all the little connections where it would have brought water to the coast into Biscayne Bay and it would have been so fresh. Biscayne Bay would have been an estuary basically with a lot of fresh water through all these little finger glades. You can see how thin and narrow that uplands were and everything else is wetlands. So this is wow. kind of a cool depiction and you can see a connection to uh, Loxahatchee up here, it's all connected and this is really, really wide, right? And then we lost all that, all that width uh, and we only have the center part, um, as you can see from this photo and we lost all that connectivity that brought fresh water to this game bay. So that's a big issue. When, with this current Everglades, that means that it's really, really hard to manage water. So you may have seen, I don't know if you've seen this photo, but here's, these little areas show the, strength of flow and the direction of flow. So the darker the blue, the more water you have flowing. And this is the same photo as before, basically. You see that contour here, the yellow? And it's a schematic done by this really neat hydrologist who did all the historical stuff. And here's the direction of which way the water would flow and how it would wrap around. And here how it flows, flows today, right? And everything you see in a line is a canal. And then you, you start looking at the arrows and you can see that things are going crazy. Like here, the water is supposed to go here. Look how it goes here and it goes into Miami and it crosses here. Some of it wraps around and goes into Florida Bay. A ton of it goes out west, right to the Shark River and those areas. Um, but look how much connectivity we have right into the East Coast that we, we've lost or we made it into a canal. And then it's, and then if you look at today, because of the levees and canals, you can see the water, for instance, comes down here and then it like turns around and it, come, it has to come this way because it can't cross the L67 canal. And then this is really dry. This is too wet. The water ponds up in here and it gets really deep and wet. Um, and then you have this issues, for instance, 
look how little water comes down to the Everglades and everything is sort of the, the light of the arrows and the green, the less water. And then you have issues where like the water now wants to go this way. You guys see that? Instead of wrapping around and going this way, it wants to go this way. And mm -hmm. this is because we sucked all the water underneath the, the urban footprint and ag and the water just shoots out, back out. And this is such a bad problem that now the Army Corps is gonna put a wall into the ground that's 60 feet deep of really? cement to keep this water from going this way. So it's really hard to manage water in today's Everglades just because it's just an engineering problem. And then, and then you get down here, of course, and you have the levee and you gotta keep these people from flooding and dry and keep all this area wet. It's just really hard to do that. Well, now for six months, they've been pumping behind the Miccosukee um, and pushing a lot of water uh, Back here, yeah. under, the, under the new bridges, yes. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's the problem. So you, you see that, right? So the water wants to go this way because this is for low elevation here and it wants yes. to go to Westchester. So there's a pump right here that's whose job is to pump constantly and back back bring that water back west. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Otherwise, Westchester floods. This is really low. <laughs> And it's just like a natural, um, kind of like a natural ponding. And the water just wants to go that way. And we've also sucked it up from the ground. So there's there's a different in pressure. There's a different in sort of the pressure, um, the head pressure on each side of the canal. And the water just wants to go, you know, go east. Okay. So that, that pump is critical. The pump backs, uh, it's the S333, I forget what it is. Three, three, four. It pumps water back this way, so it can go under the ridge. Yep. But you can imagine that it's like not very natural. You have to have a pump that consumes a lot of fossil fuels running constantly, right, to make right. things right. This is not cheap and not the best way to do it. But there's just you know you have to do these engineering things, and now there's going to be a wall going in here, pour cement sixty feet into the ground. Wow. Uh, well, that area, that area used to have a lot of frogs. And they're all died out. We were warned in the 80s that everything north of the, the Sawgrass Expressway, or the, uh, not Sawgrass, the Alligator Alley, the frogs were disappearing. Mm -hmm. Today, the froggers from Lake Okeechobee are down off the Tamami Trail because that's the last frogs left in the in the glades. They've You're about systematically been wiped out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So this area is too dry. I mean. We're going to, there's some restoration going on. They're putting in plugs. I mean, cutting up the C, the LCC7 A and C, and there's restoration that's going to go here to address that. But yeah, and then we have this other issue that if you put too much water, the the road floods, and then DOT gets involved, and you can't put that much water in the canal because it damages the roadbed. So we've had these exemptions that allow people allow us allow the to put more water in the canals. But they're short term, like three or six months, because DOT is like, if you keep your, if you keep putting more water in there, which we need for restoration, you're gonna destroy the road. So yeah, well, a couple of months ago, the water was all the way up to the road at Flamingo. I mean, the white birds were standing on the edge of the road. Yeah, yeah, but this is really good. I mean, we're getting more water that we haven't had, and I'll show you a graphic of that. So this is is, a that, really because, is that because we had 20 inches of extra rain last year, or yeah. 20 inches over normal. And they also rerouted, they've changed the way they operate operations. So instead of selling, setting that, all that extra rain like they did with Irma, they send that water to tide. They open up the floodgates and they let the water out. This, this storm, these storm events that we had in the fall, late fall, they actually send, she routed that water to the Everglades. Cool. Uh, which is really good. We, they have, they've never done that before. This is new operations that, supposed to take excess water and instead of dumping it out to the coast it's routing it south that's yeah. cool yeah so how, how do you feel the army corps of engineers uh well I guess, I'm not, responds I'm not, to your request <laughs> or do you hate uh, them like we do well you know they fund me <laughs> oh, and okay. they, they, they they pay me to study snook so on that side they're good i think you know, I think they have some very, very talented people. I had, I was at a meeting the other day, um, kind of the high levels. I was asked to present on fisheries, and you know, I think they um, are, are well intentioned, but there are engineers, you know, whose whose um, first knee jerk reaction is for engineering solutions, and sometimes they don't really take into account, you know, 
and it's not their fault. For instance, like we have, we've been managing water without taking consideration Florida Bay. It's like the end of the pipe. Nobody's thinking about Florida Bay, you know, and it's really, really hard. Like it's super hard for these engineers. You feel for them. Like, you know, creating walls on the, on the ground is pretty extreme, you know, <laughs> uh, engineering thing. And that's the only way we're going to keep, get be able to get water to, to Florida Bay and keep the water from leaving the park. So, you know, now we're bringing more water to the park and it just leaves the park. So frustrating. We're getting water down under the bridge and it just goes under. So for every drop that comes into the park, half a drop just goes under, lost. It's very frustrating. Are they, are they doing anything about getting it, getting rid of the invasive species south of the Tamiami Trail that slow down the water flow? You mean the non-natives? Yeah, the yeah. plants? There's a big, so non-native plant management is very consistent, I would say, and it's a constant effort that gets a big part of the budget. So there's, it never stops and there's crews going out all the time. Um, and I would say it's a constant effort. And you, if you look at aerial maps of the invasive cover, I mean, there's some issues like this Ligodium or, you know, vine that's now in the tree islands and that's a really bad invasive that's gonna be really hard to get rid of. But the Malaluca and some of the other traditional non-natives, they've been decreasing. However, there's new non-natives like, you know, this Ligodium stuff that comes in. It's a vine that's taking over the tree islands. So I think they're doing a good job on that front. Uh, it's, I would say it's really hard work to do all this stuff. Just there's so much, so much frustration. And when you fix something, something gets, you know, something else gets broken. <laughs>